It wasn't easy, being frank. That's what everybody called him, when they weren't calling him a dirty old tramp, or a scrounger, or a layabout. Frank, they called him. Only the people at the hostel and at the social security bothered with his full name. Francis Rossetti Hislop. Rossetti, he seemed to remember, not after the painter, but after his sister, the poet, Christina. Most often, a person, a person in authority, would read that name from the piece of paper they were holding, and then look up at Frank, not quite in disbelief, but certainly wondering how he'd come so low. He couldn't tell them that he was climbing higher all the time, that he preferred to live out of doors, that his face was weather-beaten, not dirty, that a plastic bag was a convenient place to keep his possessions. He just nodded and shuffled his feet instead, the shuffle which had become his trademark. Here he comes, his companions would cry. Here comes the shuffler, alias Frank, alias Francis Rossetti Hislop. He spent much of the spring and autumn in Edinburgh. Some said he was mad leaving in the summer months. That, after all, was when the pickings were richest. But he didn't like to bother the tourists, and besides, summer was for travelling. He usually walked north, through Fife and into Kinross or Perthshire, setting up camp by the side of a loch or up in the hills. And, when he got bored, he'd move on. He was seldom moved on by gamekeepers or the police. Some of them he knew of old, of course, but others he encountered seemed to regard him more and more as some rare species, or as one had actually said, a national monument. It was true, of course. Tramp meant to walk, and that's what tramps used to do. The term gentleman of the road used to be accurate. But the tramp was being replaced by the beggar, young, fit men who didn't move from the city and who were unrelenting in their search for spare change. That had never been Frank's way. He had his regulars, of course, and often he only had to sit on a bench in the meadows, a huge grassy plain bordered by tree-lined paths, and wait for the money to appear in his lap. That's where he was when he heard the two men talking. It was a bright day, a lunchtime, and there were few spaces to be had on the meagre supply of Meadows' benches. Frank was sitting on one, arms folded, eyes closed, his legs stretched out in front of him with one foot crossed over the other. His three carrier bags were on the ground beside him, and his hat lay across his legs, not because he was hot especially, but because you never knew who might drop a coin in while you were dozing, or pretending to doze. Maybe his was the only bench free, maybe that's why the men sat down beside him. Well, beside him was an exaggeration. They squeezed themselves onto the furthest edge of the bench, as far from him as possible. They couldn't be comfortable, squashed up like that and the thought brought a moment's smile to Frank's face. But then they started to talk, not in a whisper, but with voices lowered. The wind, though, swept every word into Frank's right ear. He tried not to tense as he listened, but it was difficult. Tried not to move, but his nerves were jangling. It's war, one said. A council of war. War? He remembered reading in a newspaper recently about terrorists. Threats. A politician had said something about vigilance. Or was it vigilantes? A council.
council of war. It sounded ominous. Maybe they were teasing him, trying to scare him from the bench so that they could have it for themselves. But he didn't think so. They were speaking in undertones they didn't think he could hear. Or maybe they simply knew that it didn't matter whether an old tramp heard them or not. Who would believe him? This was especially true in Frank's case. Frank believed that there was a worldwide conspiracy. He didn't know who was behind it, but he could see its tentacles stretching out across the globe. Everything was connected. That was the secret. Wars were connected by arms manufacturers, the same arms manufacturers who made the guns used in robberies, who made the guns used by crazy people in America when they went on the rampage in a shopping center or hamburger restaurant. So already you had a connection between hamburgers and dictators. Start from there and the thing just grew and grew. And because Frank had worked this out, he wondered from time to time if they were after him. The dictators, the arms industry, or maybe even the people who made the buns for the hamburger chains. Because he knew. He wasn't crazy. He was sure of that. If I was, he told one of his regulars, I wouldn't wonder if I was or not, would I? And she'd nodded, agreeing with him. She was a student at the university. A lot of students became regulars. They lived in Toll Cross, Marchmont, Morningside, and had to pass through the meadows on the way to the university buildings in George Square. She was studying psychology, and she told Frank something. You've got what they call an active fantasy life. Yes. He knew that. He made up lots of things, told himself stories. They whiled away the time. He pretended he'd been an RAF pilot, a spy, minor royalty, a slave trader in Africa, a port in Paris. Well, that made sense. He remembered stories about the generals and their junta. The terrorists were using Greece as their base. And Edinburgh was called the Athens of the North. Yes, of course. That's why they were basing themselves in Edinburgh, too. A symbolic gesture had to be. But who would believe him? That was the problem, being frank. He'd told so many stories in the past, given the police so much information about the conspiracy, that now they just laughed at him and sent him on his way. Some of them thought he was looking for a night in the cells, and once or twice that even obliged, despite his protests. No, he didn't want to spend another night locked up. There was only one thing for it. He'd follow the men and see what he could find. Then he'd wait until tomorrow. They were talking about tomorrow, too, as if it was the start of their campaign. Well, tomorrow was Sunday, and, with a bit of luck, if Frank hung around the meadows, he'd bump into another of his regulars, one who might know exactly what to do. Sunday morning was damp, blustery, not the sort of day for a constitutional. This was fine by John Rebus. It meant there'd be fewer people about on Brunsfield links. Terrorism, Mr. Rebus, has to be. They've had a council of war at Rhodes. Frank wrinkled his face. I don't think so. I can give you a description of them, though. They were both wearing suits. One was short and bald. The other one was young, taller, with black hair. You don't often see international terrorists wearing suits these days, do you? Rebus commented. Actually, he thought to himself, that's a lie. 
They're becoming more smartly dressed all the time. Frank frowned, thinking. Something about lavatories. Or laboratories. Must have been laboratories, mustn't it? And money. They talked about that. Money they needed to set it up. That's about it. Well, thanks for letting me know, Frank. I'll keep my ears open, see if I can hear any whispers. But listen, don't go following people in future. It could be dangerous, understand? Frank appeared to consider this. I see what you mean, he said at last. But I'm tougher than I look, Mr. Rebus. Rebus was standing now. Well, I'd better be getting along. He slipped his hands into his pockets. The right hand emerged again, holding a pound note. Here you go, Frank. He began to hand the money over, then withdrew it again. Frank knew what was coming, and grinned. Just one question, Rebus said, as he always did. It was a question a lot of his cronies asked him. Thought you were dead, they'd say each spring as he came walking back into their lives. His reply to Rebus was the same as ever. Ah, that would be telling, Mr. Rebus. That's my secret. The money passed from one hand to the other, and Rebus sauntered off towards Jawbone Walk, kicking a stone in front of him. Jawbone because of the whale's jawbone which made an arch at one end of the path. Nonsense! That first step was the easiest. It was the hundredth, the thousandth, the millionth that was hard. But not as hard as going back, never as hard as that. Rebus had counted the steps up to his second floor flat many, many times. It always added up to the same number. So how come, with the passing years, there seemed to be more? Maybe it was the height of each step that was changing. How could one cat produce that amount of odor? Rebus had seen it many a time, a fat, smug-looking creature with hard eyes. He'd caught it on his own landing, turning guiltily to look at him before sprinting for the next floor up. But it was inside Mrs. Cochran's door just now. He could hear it mewling, clawing at the carpet, desperate to be outside. He wondered. Maybe Mrs. Cochran was ill. He'd noticed that recently her brass nameplate had become tarnished. She wasn't bothering to polish it any more. How old was she, anyway? She seemed to have come with the tenement, almost as if they'd constructed the thing around her. Mr. and Mrs. Costello on the top floor had been here nigh on twenty-five years but they said she'd been here when they arrived. Same brass nameplate on her door, different cat, of course, and a husband, too. Well, he'd been dead by the time Rebus and his wife, now ex-wife, had moved here. What, was it ten years ago now? Getting old, John, getting old. He clamped his left hand onto the banister and somehow managed the last flight of steps to his door. He started a crossword in one of the newspapers, put some jazz on the hi-fi, drank a pot of tea. Just another Sunday, day of rest. But he kept catching glimpses of the week ahead. No good. He made another pot of tea, and this time added a dollop of J&B to the mixture in his mug better. And then, naturally, the doorbell rang. Jehovah's Witnesses! Well, Rebus had an answer ready for them. A friend in the know had said that Roman Catholics are taught how to counter the persuasive arguments of the JWs. Just tell them you're a Catholic, and they'll go away. I'm Catholic, he said. 
They didn't go away. There were two of them, dressed in dark suits. He was patient. Rebus had to grant them that. That's right, Mrs. Cochran. The road outside. There was a bit more of this. Then they all went indoors to talk over Mrs. Cochran's grievances. Rebus opened his own door and went in too. Then, realizing, he slapped his hand against his head. These were the two men shuffling Frank had been talking about. Of course they were. Only Frank had misheard. Council of War was Council of War. Rhodes was Rhodes. What else had Frank said? Something about money? Well, that might be the money for the repairs. That it was all planned to start on Sunday, and here they were, on Sunday, ready to talk to the residents about roadworks. What roadworks? The road outside was clear, and Rebus hadn't heard any gossip concerning work about to start. Something else Frank had heard them say. Lavatories or laboratories. Of course, his own cherished conspiracy theory had made him plump for laboratories. But what if he'd misheard again? Where did lavatories fit into the scheme? And if, as seemed certain, these were the two men, what was a local councillor doing staying at a bed and breakfast? Maybe he owned it, of course. Maybe it was run by his wife. The door was open just wide enough to allow him to squeeze inside. Open it an inch or two further, he knew. And it creaked with the almightiest groan. He tiptoed into the hallway. Councillor War's voice boomed from the living room. Bowel trouble! Terrible in a man so young! Yes, he'd no doubt be explaining why his assistant was taking so long in the lavatory. That was the excuse they always made. Well, either that or a drink of water. Rebus passed the toilet. The door wasn't locked, and the tiny closet was empty. He pushed open the next door along, Mrs. Cochran's bedroom. The young man was closing the wardrobe doors. Well, said Rebus, I hope you didn't think that was the toilet. The man jerked around. Rebus filled the doorway. There was no way past him. The only way to get out was to go through him. And that's what the man tried, charging at the doorway, head low. He's no more a counsellor than I am, Mrs. Cochran. He's a con man. His partner's been raking through your bedroom. What? She went to look. Bakewell, Rebus said, smiling. They would try the same ruse at every door where they didn't fancy their chances. Sorry, wrong address, and on to the next potential sucker, until they found someone old enough or gullible enough. Rebus was trying to remember if Mrs. Cochran had a telephone. Yes, there was one in her living room, wasn't there? He gestured to his prisoner. Let's go back into the living room, he said. Rebus could call the station from there. Mrs. Cochran was back beside him. Blood and my good quilt, she muttered. Then she saw that Rebus was in his stocking soles. You'll get chillblain, son, she said. Mark my words, you should take better care of yourself. Living on your own like that, you need somebody to look after you. Mark my words. It all connected. No, I'm off to work in a minute. Just thought I'd stop by. Here. He was holding out a ten-pound note. Frank looked at it suspiciously, moved his hand towards it, and took it. What? Didn't Rebus even want to ask him the question? You were right, Rebus was saying. What you told me about those two men, dead right. Well, nearly dead right. Keep your ears open, Frank. 
and in future, I'll try to keep my ears open when you talk to me. And then he turned and was walking away, back across the grass towards Marchmont. Frank stared at the money. Ten pounds! Enough to finance another long walk. He needed a long walk to clear his head. Now that they'd had the Council of War at Rhodes, the laboratories would be making potions for satanic rituals. They'd put the politicians in a trance, and... No, no, it didn't bear thinking about. Mr. Rebus, he called. Mr. Rebus, I go to my sister's. She lives in Dunbar. That's where I go in the winter. But if the distant figure heard him, it made no sign. Just kept on walking. Frank shuffled his feet. Ten pounds would buy a transistor radio, or a pair of shoes, a jacket, or a new hat, maybe a little camping stove. That was the problem with having money. You ended up with decisions to make. And if you bought anything, where would you put it? He'd need either to ditch something, or to start on another carrier bag. That was the problem, being frank. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.